Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel, Bad Boobs, Better Budgets. I have been wanting to do this video forever um, because I think my last video I did about my breast cancer journey, fight, whatever you want to call it, battle, because that's what it feels like sometimes was back in like December or January. So I apologize. I have been going through surgery and radiation since I posted that last video. So yeah, that's what I've been up to. And I finally have the energy and a quiet house to do my next video that I've been planning on doing forever, which is what happens after, or I should say what happened after I got diagnosed with breast cancer. So really today's video is all about that chunk of time between learning I had breast cancer and starting treatment, which was 17 days total. The longest 17 days of my life. No sleep, hardly eating, very unsure, uncertain, scared, crying nonstop. This video is not about like the symptoms that led me to believe that I had breast cancer. I already did a video about that and I will link that right here. This is all about after I got that horrible news to when treatment started and sort of the process of what happened. You know, the tests, the doctor's meetings, finding out what stage you are, how far the cancer is spread all that uncertainty. So that's what this video today is about. Before I start talking about my own personal experience, remember that everyone's cancer journey is different. Everyone's breast cancer journey is different. I was under the assumption before I got diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer, that there was just one type of breast cancer. It's in your breasts, they get it out, you go on with your life. Uh, not at all what it actually is. It's much more serious than I think when, even when I heard the words, you have cancer. Um, I guess I didn't realize how serious it was. So just know that everyone's everyone's breast cancer diagnosis is individualized. There is no one type of breast cancer. There's subtypes and then subtypes of those subtypes. And everyone's treatment plan is different. So I do want to say that before I get into what happened after I got my breast cancer diagnosis, my treatment plan, and all of that stuff, um, and then starting treatment. So I do want to preface it by preface this video by just throwing that out there. My previous video, I mentioned that August 10th, 2021 was my diagnosis date. That will be probably the date that I celebrate as my cancer anniversary from this point forward. So sort of a rebirth day for me because it was probably the worst day of my life. And I want to reclaim that day because <laughs> I don't want it to be a day that I dread every single year moving forward. I want it to be a day that I can celebrate and say, I made it, I did it, I, I'm still here on this earth. The next day was crazy. I actually had my husband stay, my husband wanted to stay home from work. Also my kids were five and two, so someone had to watch them. I was told by the nurse that called me the day before to tell me like the worst news ever, have a pen, have a piece of paper ready to go, have your phone on you all day because you're gonna be just completely inundated with phone calls, and I was. I got a call from um, a surgeon. I got a call from an oncologist's office. I got a call from the hospital saying they wanted to get me in for a breast MRI as soon as possible. Then, after I got those series of calls and kind of figuring out when I was meeting with my team, um, I was then told that um, I then got a second set of phone calls that was pushing everything up. When my oncologist office called, the very first thing they told me was, um, we're gonna be, what's your email? We're gonna email you a bunch of paperwork to fill out so that way you have it here before you meet with them. Okay, same thing with my surgeon's office, same thing. They said, I'm like, why can't you guys just share the same paperwork? <laughs> There's a lot of paperwork, but in the same, but at the same time, too, it helped me keep my mind off of things. I'm like, well, at least it, I feel like I'm being proactive now, like I'm doing something. You know, all your insurance information, family history, everything. They want to know everything about you and your health and all of that stuff. A big old pile of paperwork to fill out once I printed it all off. It was pretty crazy. Got scheduled to see the oncologist and the surgeon. I talked to the oncologist's office like three different times that day. And the third time they called, that is when I found out that I was going to be getting chemo, was on that phone call with the oncologist's office. Um, I don't know if that's standard for them to say that, you know, they just don't want women finding out maybe while they're meeting with the oncologist, because obviously it's a very upsetting thing. 
um, to lose your hair. You already are afraid you're going to lose your life. And then they're saying you're going to be on chemo. So she did tell me, she goes, with the type of breast cancer you have, and I didn't even know that I had a type of breast cancer. I just thought I had breast cancer at that point. She didn't specify what that meant, but she did say, she goes, you are going to need chemo with the type of cancer that you have and you will lose your hair. And I just, my stomach just dropped, but at least I was able to cry. I remember my husband was in his office with the kids and I went in and I was just like, I need chemo. They just told me that I need chemo. Um, Cause they said I had a type of breast cancer that I need chemo. And he's like, what? And I said, yeah, I guess, I guess that's gonna be one of the questions we ask him tomorrow when we meet with them. It was they definitely said, they recommended that obviously whoever your caregiver is to bring them or just bring a second set of ears pretty much because it's a lot of information and you want someone else there that's also writing things down or listening to um, all the information that they're gonna throw at you. So that was August 11th, 2021, all the phone calls found out that I would need chemo. August 12th, I go meet with the oncologist that they referred me to. I'm bringing all my paperwork in and Phil and I go in, I'm definitely the youngest person in the office. Everyone looks so sick. And that is where I had my first meltdown. I'm so glad I had a mask on. I had a meltdown in the oncologist's office for sure. Luckily, it took about 30 minutes to even get into a room. By then I had, I had calmed down. I'm like, girl, you've got to put yourself together because if you melt down, you're not gonna be able to hear anything. You're not gonna be able to even think to ask questions. Um, so calm down. You know, I just was telling Phil, I'm like, just, I just, he just needs to tell me that I have a chance. Because at this point I'm like, I don't know if he's gonna tell me that I have six months to live. I just know that I have a type of cancer that needs chemo. Like what the heck? We get to the office, the lady, Again, I've already filled out all this paperwork. This lady's asking me a million other health questions about myself and my family history. And it just, I'm like, I just filled out all this paperwork and you're asking me pretty much the identical questions, but that's okay. I understand they need to do their job. I get it. The doctor comes in, he's actually very young. So I was like, okay, well, apparently I'm old now because my doctor is like the same age as me. He might be a few years older than me, I don't know. But he comes in very nice. He comes in with a nurse. He, you know, kind of asks me how I'm doing. And I'm like, well, not good, doc. He's very sweet and kind and has very great bedside side manner. He's, you know, asked me questions. He's, um, then he asked to do an exam on me physically, which, you know, strangers that see your boobs when you're going through this, there's going to be a million of them. And he was the first of many. Uh, Cause your body is no longer your own. It's kind of like having a baby except minus the cute little beautiful little bundle of joy you get at the end of the nine months. It's like having a baby, but opposite of that. It's like you might live if you get through this, right? It doesn't exam, he's like examining all my collarbone, my lymph nodes, he examines both breasts and underneath my arm. And he says, well, I don't feel anything new. Or he's like, oh, other than my inflamed lymph nodes under my arm and um, obviously the very <laughs> large lump in my right breast. But he goes, I do wanna do a PET scan on you since it's spread to the lymph nodes and just to see what we're working with. He never at this point said stage four. And I am so glad he didn't because I did not even think in my head that I could be a stage four. I didn't even think it. I thought, okay, I know I'm at least a stage two because it's in my lymph nodes under my right arm. It's still in, the, it's regional, but it's, but it's there. So. Um, he goes, we need a PET scan. He's like, and we need to do genetic testing on you. And we need to do a breast MRI. I'm like, well, I'm actually, the hospital already called and I already am scheduled for a breast MRI. He's like, okay, so we'll get that PET scan, genetic test. Um, and then he's like, we're gonna aim to start chemo on the week ending August 27th, no later than that, which was at this time, we're talking, this is August 12th and he wants to start me on chemo August 27th. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, my son's due to start kindergarten like early September, so I'm just going, okay, and he goes, and you will lose your hair, you're gonna be doing six rounds, and he kind of go, goes over the drugs with me that I will be on, the type of chemo drugs I'll be on. He goes, each, I said, well, how long is each round? Is each round like weekly? Is it, he goes, it's, uh, he goes, there are three, six rounds every three weeks. You will lose your hair after the first round, 
Usually he's like, I start seeing my patients lose their hair about 10 to 12 days after the first round. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, I'm asking a bunch of questions. I actually, I'm really proud of myself. I did not lose my cool at all. Um, I just, I was even cracking some jokes at some point. Phil's like, this is so weird. <laughs> Phil, my husband, Phil was like, this is just bizarre that you're not crying now. You had a meltdown in the waiting room and now you're fine. And I'm like, well, I just want to know as much as I can about this. So he said to me, you know, he said it's out of the three big subtypes of cancer, you have one of them that we have really good targeted therapies for. And he goes with her too. It's a very aggressive type of breast cancer, but we have very effective um, targeted therapies that can kind of, he uses, he used the phrase melt. They can kind of melt the cancer. So at surgery, we can get it all out. I said that to me, I felt a lot more comforted knowing that there was a good plan in place, that chemo was obviously the right decision to make um, for the type of breast cancer that I had. And he definitely told me to stay off Google, which I did. I did stay off Google till I started treatment and then I couldn't help myself and I had to be on Google. But good meeting, I felt really good about him. I felt like I didn't need a second opinion. Um, and then yeah, just wait for all the imaging. And then he said his office would be in contact with me to get other things scheduled, to get the genetic testing scheduled and to get that PET scan scheduled and to get chemo. I would need to be taking a chemo class. Very next day, I had my breast MRI. Note to self and note to you guys, if you ever get a breast MRI, it was the out of all the testing that I've had done and I've had quite a bit since I got diagnosed, the breast MRI was the worst experience. Um, it is like a torture device. And they put you face down, um, and I'm already claustrophobic as it is. They put you on this table, you're face down, you have about this much room between the table and your yourself. And I finally told them, I'm like, I have to take my mask off, I have to. Um, and you know, it's a very loud machine and it isn't fun. And then they put your breasts in these two spots with a metal bar that separates them. Then they put your hands, it's just very, it's not a, uh, it's a very painful, I, I'm just gonna say it, it's painful. And I've been through a lot of pain in the last, what, nine months since my diagnosis, almost nine months. That was one of the worst experiences of my life. And then that next day I got a call to get scheduled for my PET scan as well on the 20th. So I was gonna be getting a full body PET scan from the base of my skull all the way to my knees the following Friday. And they were going to email me a bunch of instructions because with PET scans, you need to follow a whole diet. And as and they, and they said, you can't be, um, they list, listed all the instructions and then they said, you ha can't be within, I think six hours, you can't be within so many feet of kids under 13, I wanna say. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. So I had to figure out where I was gonna stay because my PET scan was scheduled kind of late in the afternoon. I'm like, well, obviously I can't be around my kids the rest of the day. So anyway, the joys of having cancer with small children and figuring out childcare for that, not great. Weekend goes by, I get hardly any sleep. Uh, Monday, my actual surgeon called me that I hadn't met yet. I was shocked, as you guys know how hard it is to get doctors on the phone. Referring surgeon who I haven't even met yet called me and he talked to me for like an hour about the type of breast cancer I had. He wanted to go over the results of my breast MRI that I had had the previous Friday. My main tumor was five by three centimeters, which is big. I also had, um, and they called them lesions. So basically my whole right breast was just getting completely infected with this type, with this cancer. Um, so it was lesions that weren't even picked up on the mammogram. And then as well as seeing some, uh, you know, lymph nodes light up underneath my arm. Talked to me about genetic testing. He also talked to me about um, the fact that a lumpectomy was not in the cards for me and that I, it looked, it appeared that I didn't have enough breast tissue healthy breast tissue in my right breast to make that a possibility. So I would at the very least need to have a single mastectomy. Um, he ex again explained that I have a type, my type of breast cancer is HER2 new, um, which is the same as HER2 positive. And what that means, and again, he uses the, he used the term melting. He goes, you know, 20 years ago, this cancer was pretty much a death sentence, but we have, there's great drugs now that target it and can melt it down to it practically nothing. And he goes, and in some cases, best cases, there is nothing there left. 
it can completely obliterate it. So um, it was really nice to talk to him. He goes, I just wanted to let you know that a lumpectomy is out of the question for you. And uh, you, you'll have to decide if a single mastectomy or a double. Um, but he's like, I just wanted to give you a heads up before I meet with you. And he goes, uh, which I was scheduled to meet with him on Tuesday. And on Tuesday, August 17th, I was scheduled to meet with him. So the very next day. So it was just nice. He was kind of telling me about the history of, of, you know, breast cancer and what the surgeon's role is in it. And again, he said the same thing. He's like, we really don't stage you till surgery because they just don't know the extent of the cancer until they can actually get in there. But because you're doing chemo first, it's hard to stage. And, but it was just nice to have a chat with him. Tuesday, August 17th, I have all my paperwork ready to go. I meet with my amazing surgeon that I talked to on the phone the day before. Again, he kind of just reiterates the same thing about how a lumpectomy isn't in the cards for me. It would be a single mastectomy at the very least. He did say I could have the choice of having a double or a single. Um, and he goes in a PET scan too, we'll get that. And I said, okay, and he'll go, yeah, we just wanna make sure it hasn't spread past that. He's like, but we don't have any negativity here. So we are not going to even talk about the possibility of that. And I said, oh, okay, all right. Again, I'm not Googling anything at this point. Um, I'm trying to be as positive as possible <laughs> through all this. At this point, I'm not crying. I'm not anything. I'm just asking questions. Phil's asking questions. Um, just trying to get through the craziness. I'm just counting down the days until treatment can start. At this point, he's kind of talking to me about my port as well. He goes, we got to get you into surgery and get your port place because um, if you don't know, a port is something they put into your chest, which I can show you guys mine. There it is right there. There is my port with the nice little scar. And I said, well, do you recommend getting a port? He goes, absolutely, it saves your veins. This chemo will kill your veins if you don't get a port. So I said, okay, so I guess I'm getting a surgery. <laughs> Um, two, before I even start chemo. Okay, all righty. Someone who never has had health issues in the past. Uh, I'm getting just all the surgeries and all the testing and all the imaging done. So he told me that I would be getting that um, a day or two before chemo started for me. Then Wednesday, August 18th, I get two calls. I get one call from my surgeon's office that's saying, hey, we can get you in for genetic testing tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, because I still at this point hadn't heard from my oncologist about the genetic testing. So I'm like, well, I'm assuming that it's the same test. They just test for a bunch of different um, genetic mutations that make you more, um, that could, if you test positive for, could make you more um, susceptible to different types of cancer, like ovarian, breast, and then, but I guess they test like skin cancer. They test just a bunch of different cancers. And then that's when they would recommend either a double mastectomy or um, removal of your uterus or an ovary or two. Okay, so I got a call from my surgeon's office to come into the surgeon's office for genetic testing the following day. And I got another call, yet another reminder about my PET scan instructions and all that entailed that, which is basically types of foods to avoid the day before your PET scan, fluids that you can drink, um, your time for cutoff of eating or drinking anything the day before, all that fun stuff, as well as, you guessed it, more paperwork. Thursday, August 19th, I had an appointment to go to my surgeon's office. Phil did not come with me to this appointment just because it was genetic testing. They just took some samples of my blood and I talked with a genetic counselor as well, which I thought that was weird. They left the room and then they said, here's a number to call when you're um, here's a number to call. You talk to a genetic counselor. They ask you some questions. I guess it's like for research purposes. I, I don't know. Did that. Um, left the surgeon's office. And the hospital called yet again after I got home and scheduled my port surgery for August 26th. So to get my chemo port in, and I had to be there at 5 a.m. first thing and all the instructions for that, as well as letting me know that I had to obviously get tested for the C word, the other C word. Friday, August 20th, my PET scan, the, the, the moment of truth to see where exactly this cancer was in my body and if it had spread. Um, very nervous and also very, very hungry. Cause again, like I said, you can't really eat or drink anything the night before. You can have like small sips of water. And a truth PET scan, it was scheduled for I think early mid afternoon. I had already arranged to spend the night with my parents. I actually brought one of my kids stuffed animals so I could snuggle with them because I was a big baby at this point. <laughs> my husband was watching them all day. 
uh, went into the PET scan. They give you, um, they inject you with radioactive material pretty much so they can see what's going on in your body. They put you in this d nice dark room. They give you a, a warm blanket and they kind of let you rest and let it all go through your system. And then they pull you into a room. It all set up to be in the machine. Um, I remember the lady, I was wearing this loose fitting skirt um, and there was a sticker on my butt. She goes, there's a sticker on your butt. I said, oh, and she goes, and I went to re re remove it and she goes, no, leave it on there for good luck. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I, so I did. I'm like, I, okay, I guess I'll leave it on for good luck. I guess, do I need good luck? I, okay. Can I just tell you the PET scan is such a, it's nerve wracking obviously because the results you just don't know what they're going to find um especially once you know there's already cancer in your body but it the process of the pet scan compared to the breast mri which is what i just did the previous week oh so much nicer it's quiet in there it's almost dare i say like a spa experience um yeah the imaging whatever machines they use for the imaging is just it's just so much more quiet and calm on my back and just sort of yes I'm claustrophobic yes it's a tube um but compared to the breast MRI which I was just traumatized by it wasn't that bad at all um the whole process took I want to say 30 45 minutes to get everything scanned um because they kind of run you through the tube run you back and then kind of go inch by inch very slowly uh you know scanning every part of your body um, but I did ask her, I just said, you know, when am I supposed to get the results? This was Friday afternoon, right when, around the time that they were going to be closing up in the next hour or two. And she goes, um, your doctor should have it by next, early next week. And I said, okay, all right, cool. Well, well this is going to be fun, fun weekend for me. So this is the final week before I go in and start that chemo on the 27th. Again, I'm getting scheduled for the chemo class. My port surgery is scheduled for the 26th at this point. So it's scheduled for a day before I start chemo. Um, I'm scheduled to start chemo at 9 a.m. to be there to meet with the doctor and uh, go over my PET scan and um, start my first treatment on the 27th. All of this has already been scheduled the previous week. Um, Monday the 23rd, something I had not mentioned yet in this video is heart tests. With the targeted therapy that I'm on, specifically, specifically the Herceptin, which is targeted for the HER2 positive breast cancers, it's rough on your heart. It can be very rough on your heart. Oh, so they just wanted to give me a baseline heart test on that Monday to kind of see where I was at. Um, that process was about an hour. It's, they just went through the whole heart area. They're moving my breasts up and down and left and right. I mean, they are, the lady that did it was Again, not the most pleasant experience. Better than the breast MRI. I found out that I was going to be needing a heart test every um, other month. I think I've had four now, I want to say. So just to see how my heart is still taking the Herceptin. I had my heart test on Monday the 23rd. 24th and 25th, at this point, I'm just waiting for Friday. But I'm also waiting for my PET scan results. And I'm not getting any phone calls. So I'm like, well, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing because I'm already scheduled to get my port in on Thursday morning and I'm scheduled to start treatment on Friday morning. And at this time, like all my family knows, friends know that I had a PET scan on that Friday and they're like, have you gotten any results yet? Have you gotten any results yet? Um, and I keep saying, no, they haven't called me. I actually did call on Wednesday morning first thing and I talked to um, one of the ladies that works in my oncologist's office and I said, you know, I haven't heard anything about my PET scan results yet. And they're like, okay, we'll let him know that you called and he'll get back to you. Nothing. So at this point, I'm like, well, whatever my results are from my PET scan, my treatment's not changing. They're not canceling my port surgery. They're not canceling my first chemo treatment. So, okay. So I'm kind of like, like uh, it can't be horrible, horrible news because he hasn't called right away. So I guess I was like, kind of, that's good. Um, the 25th, we dropped my kiddos off over at my parents house to do to have a little sleepover over there because we were getting up so early the next day for the surgery to get my port in so happy to finally be starting treatment um i had to take a pregnancy test make sure i wasn't pregnant uh let's see they wheeled me in the whole process it was really a very quick procedure um i did not know that my 
neck would be like sticking out like this. And you guys can see I have a lot of scars because, um, which I'm hoping eventually go away. Um, but I can get back into the chemo thing, but the stuff that they put on me was itching me so bad. So in the next week or so, I was scratching at it, not realizing my skin was super, super sensitive to the chemo drugs. And that's why I have all these nice little, little things here. But yeah, as you can see, the port and then it goes all the way up into your neck. Some people have their ports placed on their um, right side. Wait, this is my right. <laughs> Some people have their ports placed on the right side. Some people have it on their left side. Some people have it on the side that doesn't have the cancer. Some people do. I had it on my cancer side. I, he made it sound like he always puts it on the right side regardless um, because that's just what he does. That's his preferable um that's the side that he usually puts it on is always on the right side, no matter if the cancer's on it or not. So I don't know. There's conflicting information. There's some women that say they're on, that their surgeon puts it on the non-cancerous side. Uh, I don't know why that would be. He made it sound like he does it on the right side, regardless of where the cancer is. So um, I figure, hey, my port is closer. They're going to access it. The port's closer to the cancer boot. It's just going to get, it goes through your whole body anyway. The chemo does. So right? Got to, it's got to kill it all, right? We get to the hospital. I get the surgery in, wake up pretty, pretty quickly. No, no issues. I rest for a lot of that day. The moment of truth, we go and see my oncologist who I assume is going to go over the PET scan results and also start my first chemo, which at this point I was just so excited. I'm like, I want this cancer out of my body. I want to start killing this beast that is in there, that is taking up residence. Excited, but also very nervous too. We did take an, a um, chemo class over the phone with a nurse from my oncologist's office. I want to say two days prior. So maybe the day before my port surgery. Okay, so we did take a chemo class on kind of what to expect, what to bring, that they would be serving lunch and snacks. And I really didn't need to bring anything if I didn't want to, but obviously was able to bring, you know, they had a TV there, but you could also bring a book. Phil actually set me up with an iPad. He's so sweet. He set me up with an iPad so I could watch all my TV shows. Like, cause I was going to be there. They said the first day, I, my first round, I would be there for eight hours. And I was, I showed up at nine and then I think I left at five ish. Um, yeah, five, 435. I was the last, I was the first one in and the last one out because, um, anyway, I'll do a whole chemo video too. I'll do a whole chemo cause that's a whole other beast, but we'll just talk about the 27. So met with my oncologist. Um, you know, I did, he did say first off the bat, he's like, any questions before you start your chemo? I'm like, pet scan results. <laughs> he's like, oh yeah, your pet scan results. He's like nothing remarkable, which normally when someone tells you anything about yourself that you're not remarkable, it's an insult. But in cancer, I have learned it is a be it's the best news you can get. So he goes, yes, we did see some lymph nodes. Um, they're all regional, light up, as well as the, we already knew the mass and then the lesions in your, in your right breast. I was so, I'm gonna cry right now. I was so happy to hear that it had not spread past my lymph nodes. Um, so that was great news just realizing like how lucky I was. And then um, I asked him, I said, the other question I have is everyone, I said, can you, I know you yourself and um, my surgeon, I won't say their names on here, but um, I know you guys both said you can't really stage cancer until surgery. And like with, obviously with chemo, it gets a little bit more complicated because you're having the chemo first then the surgery. But I said, can you just give me a stage? Because everyone's asking me what stage I am. I don't know if they're planning my funeral or they're planning a party. I don't know if they're at this point if they're if what what it is. So he goes, he goes, um, and he, you know, he goes through my pet imaging again. And then he goes, um, he goes, tell, he's like, I would stage you at a 2B, which I already knew I was a stage two, uh, a stage between a two and a three because of lymph node involvement. And because of how big my initial tumor was, but he goes, tell your friends and family that you are, he goes, I would do like an estimate of a two B, um, before chemo starts. And he goes and just tell your friends and family, but that not only is your cancer treatable, but that it's curable. And that's all I needed to hear. That's it. That's all I need to hear. I was trying not to cry on this video, but that's, I got just, it was just the best news. And 
Um, they whisked me back to my chemo chair and they got me all set up. And that's a whole other video that I will do at a different time because this video is already, before editing, is 47 minutes long. So I will try to cut that down to about 20 minutes or less. It happened after I got diagnosed with breast cancer between my diagnosis and when I first started treatment, that's 17 days. So that was my experience. Again, that is just my experience. Everyone's is different. Yeah, just lots of phone calls, lots of people, texts, um, people bringing gift baskets and sw the sweetest gifts to me, um, you know, praying for me. It just meant the world, so. Those, um, if you've been newly diagnosed with breast cancer and haven't started treatment yet um, and have a lot of questions and not a lot of answers, it does get better. And it's, it, I think my first night of chemo um, was the best sleep I've gotten in weeks because I would just was like, it's killing the cancer. Um, it's no longer spreading. Oh, thank you so much for watching this very long-winded video about kind of what happened after my breast cancer diagnosis and treatment plan. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye.